Check, check, check. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand up. Come on in. Everybody's a little sleepy this morning. I don't know what you guys did this weekend, but you're all... You're, that, you wore yourself out doing laundry. That's what it was. So. I want to read just uh, the first part of Psalm 149, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing to Jesus. Sound good? Okay, no one's into that. Anyone? Does it sound good? All right. There we go. Come on. All right. So Psalm 149, praise the Lord. And actually, the Hebrew word is hallelujah. That's what hallelujah means. It means praise the Lord. If you didn't know that, now you know that. And it's literally praise Yahweh. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, make melody to him with a tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. And I like this part, let the high praises of God be in their throats and a two-edged sword, and two-edged swords in their hands. Father God, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for sleepy Sundays and laundry weekends, and we thank you for summertime, and thank you for this beautiful space. Thank you for the house of God and the gift of prayer and worship and the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And God, we just invite you into the space this morning. Lord, bless this 10 a.m. service, bless the 12 p.m. service. Jesus, come into this room this morning and do what only you can do. We love you, we worship you, we honor you. It's in your holy name we pray. And everybody said? All right. Let's worship the Lord. Let's lift our hands. Let's sing to Jesus.
Good morning, church. We're so happy to have you guys here. It's so good to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Just to be able to, to lift up a shout of praise to God in a place with believers that believe the same thing as you. And God, we just take this time and we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for the promise that you bring in Jesus Christ. We thank you for each individual person in this room, Lord, that you brought them here for a reason. This isn't just some happenstance, God. We, we truly believe that you're sovereign. There, there are three things that I know for sure in my own life, and, and I'm sure that my brothers and sisters here can attest to this, that, that God is good, that God is sovereign, and he loves you. Those are three consistencies that will never, ever leave. He loves you, he's sovereign, and he's good. And so we, we worship a good God here today, Lord. We, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled.
We praise you for what you've done for us, Lord. We praise you for our salvation. We praise you for the way that you transform us, Lord. But those two things are amazing, but nothing compares to the fact that you are who you are, Lord. You are glorious. You are holy. You are perfect. Aside from what you've done for us, Lord, you are worthy of praise, God. Take us from one degree of glory to the next, Lord. Make your people ready for your coming, Lord. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, but make us ready. We want to be ready. We want to seek your face, Lord. We want to seek your holiness, Lord. We praise you, God. Set my sights on his face for the rest of 
walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, we know you are with us. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We know that you overcome the darkness, Lord, that you break chains, that you break the stronghold of sin in our lives, God. Set us down, Lord. Be still and know that he is God, amen? It's so hard to actually believe that. We always want to try to do something. But God just wants us to rely on him. He has it all figured out. We thank you, Lord. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? And so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth? Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings.
You know what I'd like us to do, and I didn't ask the band this, so they might get mad at me, but uh, I want us to sing the third song again. But let's do this. Let's, let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you feel comfortable doing it, just put your hands out in front of you. And just repeat after me. You don't have to do this, but if you want to do it, you can do it. Just say, Father in heaven, first of all, we wish you happy Father's Day. Come on, let's give our Father in heaven a big round of applause. God is our real dad, and we have a perfect Father in heaven who will always be there for us, who will always love us. In the story of the prodigal son, he's actually the prodigal. To be a prodigal means to be uh, just reckless, and God comes running after us because he loves us so much. He's a generous father. He's a big-hearted father. But anyways, let's get back to what I was doing. So say, Father in heaven, in Jesus' name I pray, forgive me for all my sins. God, I'm so sorry. And wash me clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. And Spirit of God, fill me again this morning. I need you again this morning. Fill me up with you so that my life can bring you glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a round of applause. Let's thank Jesus. Now what I want us to do is I want us to sing that third song with all that we have. In the Psalms, we're commanded to worship the Lord with our whole heart. The Bible says that we are to exalt him and to exalt means to praise enthusiastically. And David often in the Psalms, he says, I will praise the Lord. We don't wait until we feel like it. We tell ourselves to praise the Lord because God is worthy to be praised. And then what happens is as we worship God, our feelings catch up with our choices. And so we will worship God this morning because God is worthy to be worshiped this morning regardless of what I feel like. So come on, let's sing that thir thir third song. Let's sing it with all of our hearts. Let's sing to God with our whole hearts in this place this morning. Yahweh, set us down in green pastures. Yahweh, set us down in green So 
Yahweh, you're the, you're the king of the universe. Everything must bow before you. You're sovereign over the storm. You're sovereign over everything in this world. We worship you, Yahweh. I pray even this morning, God, that this, this room, God, this church would be a green pasture, Lord. It would be a place where we can rest. It would be a safe place. It would be a place of abundance, a place of food. And Jesus, you're our good shepherd, and we can, we can rest knowing that you're, you're watching over us, you're protecting us, you're keeping us safe. Jesus, you are our pastor, you're the pastor of this church, and we are the sheep of your hand. Lay us down in green pastures, even this morning, in this place, God. We love you, Yahweh. We worship you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said... Come on, let's give the worship team a big round of applause for pouring their hearts out. Man, that was a special moment. That was awesome. <laughs> now you got to listen to me for 30 minutes. I apologize. So no. <laughs> All right, take two minutes. Say hi to somebody new. Shake off the sleepiness and be friendly, be social, meet a couple people, say hi to somebody.
Check, check. Sit down, Xavier. Stop trying to talk to me. I'm trying to do announcements. <laughs> I have a job this morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning uh, to all the fathers out there. Happy Father's Day. I think I know like two in the room right now. So extra happy Father's Day to you. Uh, we love you and fathers are so important um, and we just are so grateful to have you here this morning and to celebrate you on your special day. And I have lots of announcements for you this morning. Um, the first one is the prayer meeting tomorrow. I've been hearing amazing things about it. So I encourage you to come out 7 p.m. at See, I can't speak this morning. 7 p.m. at 4 Rutherford Place. Um, and come join us as we lift up our city and our nation and our world in prayer. And next is the discipleship cohort group. And it is the last dance this week. <laughs> this is it. And if you've been coming, uh, to, like attending the cohort for the last few weeks, I feel like we owe you a graduation ceremony. Because if I know anything about Mike, it was probably like college level coursework. So you deserve like a little, you know, cap, uh, cap moment. So I cheers you on. Um, but if you'd like to come out, even if you haven't been coming, that's going to be this Thursday, 7 p.m. Yep, 7 p.m. And just RSVP online if you could, if you'd like to join. Um, next is prayer. If you would like prayer today, uh, there will be people after service. I think they still got those yellow little wristbands, which remind me of like a gospel rave, you know? <laughs> um, I'm just going to go dance with them in the back. Um, but if you want prayer, you can go find them and they'll pray over you in person. Otherwise, there are cards on the back table that you can fill out uh, with your prayer requests. And I know the prayer team and Mike are faithful to pray over those. And next is volunteering. If you have a friendly face and you speak English, um, I encourage you. <laughs> Honestly, even if you don't speak English, let's mix it up, you know, like, bonjour. Um, come and be one of our volunteers as a greeter. Uh, you can talk to Mary or Kyle about that. We always uh, love to welcome people with a friendly face. So if you think that might be you, I encourage you to come out and volunteer. And next is giving. So there are many ways to give. They're up here on the screen, so I'm not going to go through them. Um, but I encourage you guys to pray over what the Lord is uh, ministering to you to give. Um, I know New York City is a tough city. Uh, if anybody else there has student loans, they're supposed to pick up again this year, and I'm low-key terrified. So um, <laughs> I'm really praying God's sovereignty over my finances um, <laughs> as we move into that season of my life. Um, but if you're like me or just you know praying over that I encourage you to uh, seek what the Lord would have you to give because we are a church that is not pop-up but you know trying to survive in New York City and that can always be a challenge financially so I encourage you to give um, to the kingdom of the Lord and uh, Cole is going to come up and read the passage for us but before he does that I'm going to pray and that's it Dear Holy Father, I just thank you so much for this day, and I thank you so much, Lord, um, for just the gifts that you've given us. Just the ability to live in New York City is such a blessing, um, and it's so humbling to be able to have the resources and the opportunity to live here, Father God, in such a great city. And being here nearly 12 years, Lord, I just see your hand of provision over my life and my finances, and I pray, Lord, that you would continue to do so, not only over my life, but those in this room. And I thank you, Father God, um, for this church. And I pray that you'd give us wisdom and guidance on how to use your resources to further your kingdom. And Father, I pray for the fathers in this room. I thank you for them. I thank you for their lives. I pray that you would bless them and that you would give them the strength, Father, to be the dads that their children need, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you would heal them, that you would open their hearts and allow them to just be a godly example of who you are, Lord Jesus. And I pray for those in this room, Lord, who maybe don't have a good relationship with their dads or are missing their dads this morning or maybe don't know where their dads are today, Father God. I pray for their hearts, Lord Jesus. I pray for healing. I pray for hope. I pray for restoration, Lord, in relationships. And I pray, Father, that we can celebrate this day because we have you as a good, good Father God who loves us and cares for us and takes care of us each and every day. So I thank you, Lord, for that. Bless Cole as he reads your word. Bless Mike as he preaches to us today. In your name, amen. Yeah, let's give it up for Grace. All right, if you guys remember last week, we uh, caught some momentum and flew through the first half of Mark chapter 4. Um, and with another encouraging word, Pastor Mike, pa encouraging word, Pastor Mike is going to be moving pretty quickly again today. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 34. And it reads... 
And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and you still more will be added to you. For to the, to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? Is it like a grain of a mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth? Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nest in its shade? With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again for, for your goodness this morning and the opportunity to gather uh, with brothers and sisters and um, glean from your word and worship you and just, just thank you for who you are. Uh, and we just ask that you would be with Pastor Mike over these next few minutes as he delivers a word uh, that you've given him. Pray that you would speak through him and that each of our hearts might receive uh, the word that you have for us today. That you would continue to reveal yourself um, through your word uh, and that we might sense your spirit in this place. In most heavenly precious name, amen. Let's give Cole a big round of applause. And if you haven't noticed, the... The tall, handsome man that normally leads worship, Roth, has not been here the last two weeks because Roth and Becky had their baby. Can we just give them a round of applause? <laughs> Big, healthy baby that looks just like Roth. So I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know what that means long term, but uh, it looks just like Roth. So, and uh, Becky made a little rough. So, uh, and then Cole and Emma are actually pregnant as well. So come on. Michael and Paula, I'm not sure if you're here this morning, they're pregnant as well, so <laughs> something's in the water here, or the coffee, or I don't know what it is, so we <laughs> Stephen and Marta, are, that's right, they're pregnant as well, so <laughs> we're making Christian babies here, that's what we're doing, <laughs> so uh, I lost my train of thought, so I don't know where to go from there. Also, the third song that we sang that I, I made them sing it again, you know what? They didn't want to say anything, but our worship team actually wrote that song. That's a movement original. So, and we're talking about, you know, actually uh, possibly this summer, maybe in the fall, like recording an EP with a bunch of these songs that they've written. And the funny thing is there's the one song they wrote, uh, Clean Water. I get emails and texts about that all the time saying, I can't find it on Spotify. I'm like, it's not on Spotify. That's a movement original. And that's like the single most requested song that people uh, ask us about. So, and, and those guys wrote that. So don't they have an anointing on their lives? Come on, let's thank them for that work. And lastly, minus the, that Wednesday, the apocalyptic Wednesday where the sky turns orange, I was like, well, this is the end of the world and it's going to be like this forever. Is a... Uh, it's, this has actually been probably the best spring we've, uh, we've had in New York City in the entire time I've lived here. Can we just give God a round of applause for the beautiful weather? I think he's like, all right, COVID was hard. I'm going to give you like an amazing spring because you guys kind of earned it. But all right, well, the title for this morning's message is Four Vital Kingdom Principles. And I want to take a few minutes to unpack these. Their kingdom light is meant to be shared. In the kingdom, with the measure we use, it will be measured to us. Kingdom growth comes from God, and the kingdom will begin small, but will one day fill the universe. Let me pray, and we'll take a few minutes to unpack these. God, we thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you that your word is supernatural, and that, Lord, we are actually transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so I pray this morning, as we take a few minutes to look at your word, transform us, God. Make us different, Lord. Transform this space this morning, God. Make it a holy place. Make it a, a thin place, God, where we actually encounter you and we're transformed by that encounter, Lord. 
I thank you for everyone that's here in this room this morning, Lord. They got up, they made the effort to be here, and I pray that you would reward them for being in your house. Bless this time now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first kingdom principle that we see in these parables is kingdom light is meant to be shared. And Jesus says, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on the stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus says, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? It's a rhetorical question, and the answer is what? It's no. Because first of all, if you put a lamp underneath a bed, what will happen to the bed? It, it, will, it will catch on fire. <laughs> Not a trick question, you're like, there's got to be some deep theological thing. No, the bed will cut light on fire. It's like, and you don't put a lamp under a bowl because what will end up happening is you won't be able to get any light from it. And that defeats the whole purpose of it. A lamp is to be put on a stand so that everyone can see its light. And that's what we're to do. In this parable, who is the lamp? You don't you just say it out loud, nice and strong. Jesus, okay. Jesus is the lamp. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the light in the darkness. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And we are to lift up his name and his message as high and as publicly as we possibly can so the whole world can see his light. You know, we're working on something right now. I think we're gonna do it. Let me check my calendar here. I'm not, don't worry, I'm not texting while I'm preaching. It's, uh, you're like... Uh, I think we're looking at, yeah, Thursday, July 13th. We're actually, the next Seek Night we're going to do, we're going to do it at Times Square. And mark my words, because I, I need hard deadlines. It's just the way I operate is uh, we're going to have movement merch by then. And I want to promote it really well on Instagram. I want to open it up to the city. And we're not even going to worry about permits in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to do it guerrilla style. So we're just going to have acoustic guitars and a cajon. I want everyone wearing movement t-shirts. We're going to print out like 200 copies of the lyrics. And we're just going to invade Times Square. And we're going to sing open, openly and publicly to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And also what I, what I want to do is I want to have some brave souls lined up to share testimonies. I want to have resource tables with tracts and Bibles. And I want to go to the most public place on planet Earth, the center of our planet, Times Square, and I want to lift up the name of Jesus Christ as high and as publicly as we possibly can. Because that's what you do with a lamp. You know, we don't want to just hide our lamp in a beautiful, comfortable cellar at 27 West 23rd Street in Midtown Manhattan. We don't want to just keep all this kingdom blessing to ourselves. You know that if you know Jesus Christ, you are the richest person in the world? You are the richest person in the world. But we don't want to be selfish and keep all this to ourselves. We want to take this kingdom blessing out into the city. And we're not to hide our light. We're not to be secret saints or covert Christians. (laughs) We're to not keep all these wonderful kingdom blessings to ourselves. We're to share them with everyone. We're to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and make disciples of all the nations. And you know what? Look, there's a spiritual cancer that is killing everyone, and it's called sin. And there's only one cure, and we have that cure, and his name is what? It's Jesus. Jesus. He's the answer. Brother Andrew, who was a Dutch Christian, he wrote a really awesome book called God's Smuggler. And if you ever want, it's very easy to read. It's, it's, it's an amazing book. It, it changed my life. I read it when I was a youth pastor, and it kind of ruined me to just like the traditional ministry track. <laughs> After I read that book, I thought, you know what? I want to live a crazy life of faith. But Brother Andrew, he was a Dutch Christian who smuggled Bibles behind the Iron Curtain during the Soviet Union. And he said this, I have a slide for it. He says, we have to live a life that is more revolutionary than that of the revolutionaries. Everyone else today is radical and public and outspoken about their beliefs and their identity. I think Christians should be equally so, Amen? amen? If that's the game we're playing today, then Christians, we need to be playing that game as well. If everybody else is transparent and completely open about who they are and what they believe, then as Christians, we need to be equally so. And with kindness and love and grace, we should be as vocal and public about our faith as everyone else. Jesus says, you don't take a lamp and hide it under your bed or put a bowl over it. You put it up in the highest place so that everybody can see its light. 
And we need to ask the Lord to give us the courage and the boldness to take our faith beyond the four walls of this church into the real life of our city. And I actually think we'd be pleasantly surprised by the response. I think more people are are open to Jesus than we realize. I really do. I'm going to talk about it more in just a moment. Yesterday, I was riding the Staten Island Ferry, and I was telling the pre-service prayer about this with a friend of mine. By the way, that's like the best like free thing you can do in New York City, amen? And the whole key to Staten Island Ferry is stay at the very, very back, the back right corner, and, and wait right there, like right where they put the rope. And what'll happen is you'll go right by the Statue of Liberty, and everybody will want to be in that spot, but you'll already be there in Jesus' name, amen? That's my secret, right? And it's just the funnest thing. And now they've built this like outlet mall over in Staten Island, which never really took off the poor outlet mall, but there's a Shake Shack, and you can go over there. It's just, it's a really super fun day trip. And it's fun to feel like a tourist in New York City. But when we were in the, uh, the ferry terminal, like before you get on the ferry, I'm totally like getting ahead of my sermon. I'll, I'll just tell you anyways. Is there's like these digital screens that let you know what time the next ferry is going to be going. And there's some church that is buying digital ads, sharing the gospel at the ferry terminal. It says, it says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is Lord. I was, it, it blew my mind. I could not believe that was up there. And then what happened was there was this Christian group from Portland, and they're just in the city. And when they saw that they were so inspired by it, it was like 100 of them, they started singing hymns in the ferry terminal, and every time they would stop, the entire ferry terminal would break into applause. I'm telling you, I think that Christians are more like scared than, the, than, than people actually, than we, than we realize. Like people want to hear the gospel. I think more people would be open to it than we realize. You're always gonna have the random hater and there's nothing you can do about it. But I actually think more people are into it than we realize. And I saw that yesterday at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal, amen? So, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, what does he say? He says, let your light so shine before men, publicly, in the real life of the city, outdoors, on your social media, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, and every facet of your life, what? So they might see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And also, it's like hide and seek. God has hidden the truth so that it will be found. And once we find it, he wants us to shout it from the rooftops. Jesus literally says this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. He says, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, what? Proclaim on the housetops. And this is what happened to me. When I met Jesus, when I was 18 years old, I felt like I had discovered the secret of life. I mean, I did, amen? And, and once I found that, I was like, everybody's gotta know about Jesus. <laughs> This is the most amazing thing ever. Everybody needs to know about this. So I went out to Bible college, and then I was a youth pastor and a pastor and a church planter. And this is what I've, in my own feeble, imperfect ways, this is what I've been trying to do for the last 31 years, is is shout it from the, the rooftops that Jesus is the answer. The second kingdom principle we see is in the kingdom, with the measure we use, it will be measured to us. Verses 24 through 25, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from him, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now, the first thing to notice about this is Jesus says, what's the first thing he says in the beginning of this? He says, pay attention to what you hear. And I want to tell you something is that listening is essential in the kingdom of God. God has given us two ears and one mouth so that we'll listen twice as much as we speak, amen? We have to wait on the Lord. Please hear this, we have to wait on the Lord, we have to listen to Jesus, and we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is our leader and we have to get our direction from him. And the other thing too, and I've shared this many, I've shared this many times, is that you know what, Jesus knows how to reach New York City. He knows how to crack the code. He knows, he knows, how, he knows, where to, he knows how to show us where to drop our nets. Well, we'll find a catch that's too big to pull into our boat. And I've been, I've been thinking about this so much. Lately. I feel like Jesus is like, Mike, I can show you how to reach New York City. <laughs> I'm like, no, I got this, Jesus. I got it covered. <laughs> He's like, Mike, I know how to do it. Do you want me to help you? No, I'm, not, I got, I'm good. You go, you do you, Jesus, and I'll do me. Let me just take care of this in my own strength and energy because I've been so successful over the last 13 years. <laughs> 
you know, it's like, I've just been crushing it, Lord. He's like, he's like I can show you how, but you got to listen to me. This, I, this may not be the word for you or it's, it's for somebody in the audience say, the word of the Lord for me, Mike Doyle, is wait on the Lord. Wait on him. Listen to him. Be sensitive to him. He'll show us how to do it. But what I've also found too is if we won't listen to him, if we're too busy listening to him, he'll let us wear ourselves out. And then when we burn ourselves out, you're like, I'm so burned out. Jesus is like, that's your problem. I didn't burn you out. You burned yourself out. If you would have listened to me, you wouldn't be burned out. That's all on you. I've got nothing to do with this. What's going on with you right now? That's your fault. You know, actually, Jesus isn't so, ju- I'm judgmental. Jesus isn't judgmental. <laughs> you're like, that's awful judgy. That's Mike Doyle. That's not Jesus. Jesus isn't judgmental. <laughs> Look at what Psalm 81, verses 13 through 16 says. And this, this passage always haunts me. I read through the Psalms kind of back to back, and every time I come to Psalm 81, I just put my head down. I'm like, I'm so sorry, Lord. Listen to what it says. If my people would what? If they would only listen to me. If Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him, and their punishment would last forever. But you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. We have to create space to hear Jesus' voice. If we're always distracting ourselves, listening to music, listening to podcasts, watching television, on social media, listening to audiobooks, and look, I'm as guilty as everybody else. I don't like to waste time. And from the moment I get in the morning to the moment I go to bed at night, I just fill my day with, I want, I want to be learning or I want to be thinking about something. But we, we have to make sure that we're setting aside time for what I call holy silence. And if we don't do that, then we won't be able to hear his voice. His voice will be drowned out by all the other voices. Because the voice of Jesus is a still, small voice. Old school Christians, they used to call it the whisper of God. But you can't hear that still small voice. You can't hear that whisper of God if his voice is being drowned out by every other voice. You have to create space to hear the voice of God. And I want to tell you one little secret. You're like, Mike, I live in New York City, man. This is, this, this, the background noise of the city is so intense. I know. You know where I hear God's voice so clearly is when I get up early in the morning. You get up around 4.30 or 5 in the morning, you're like, what are you talking about? Just try it sometime. You get up super early. And that's what Jesus would do. The Bible says that Jesus would go off. He says he would get up before the sun would rise and he'd go off and he'd find a lonely place and he would pray. You get up really early like that, man, you can hear the voice of God. The earliest Quakers, because I'm I'm just, it's like my little pastor nerd fascination right now is early Quakerism. And the early Quakers, what they would do, it sounds crazy, but it's kind of awesome, is they would literally, they, they would go to a Quaker meeting house they didn't call their buildings churches because they believed the people of God was the church, not the structure. Amen? And they would gather in these meeting houses, and there'd be like hundreds of them, and they would sit in complete silence for hours, just waiting upon the voice of the Lord. They called it holy obedience. But we have to listen to Jesus, and he speaks to us through many different channels. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through other Christians. He speaks to us through worship. He speaks to us through prayer, and he speaks to us through quiet times of silence. And sometimes it's, it's literally as simple as, like, I drive in the city, which is like, it's like World War III every day, you know what I mean? I drive in New York City. But sometimes it's as simple as just turning off the music, don't listen to a podcast, quiet my mind, and in that 30-minute drive from my house to Brooklyn, it's two miles and it takes two hours, in that, in that short amount of time, just be quiet and use that time just to be open to the voice of the Lord, to be open to just God speaking to me, and he'll speak to me. Every, all the best ideas I've ever had in ministry and the ones that always work and take off are the ones that God gave me in a moment of silence as I was listening to him. He'll go, you know what? Try this. And I try it, and it goes off. And the measure in this parable is literally a measuring cup. If we use a large measuring cup in the things of God, God will use a large measuring cup with us. The more we listen, the more we lean in, the more we learn, The more we obey and apply God's truth to our lives, the more we use what God has given us, the more he'll give us. My dad has a saying, he he says, if you want to get something done, find a busy person. (laughs) And in a sense, God feels the same way. He's like, you're using everything I'm giving you, well, then I'm just going to give you more. 
The more we use what God has given us, the more he'll give us. It's a principle of the kingdom. If we want to know God deeply, he'll reveal himself to us deeply. And I want to tell you something. I've said this many times before, but it's an important truth, is that we can go as deep into Jesus as we want to go. You say, man, Mike, I love those worship moments when we're singing that Yahweh song. You know what? Yeah, you can actually replicate those moments in your own home, and you can go even deeper. And as a church, we're trying to provide more opportunities for you to go deeper, and I would challenge you to take advantage of them. There is no bottom and there is no limit. The only limit is with us. We can have as much of the Lord as we want. If we want to be used by God greatly and we're willing to make the sacrifices and have the discipline that comes along with that, then we can be used by God greatly. But if we want to stay in the shallow end, then we'll only ever have a shallow end experience of God. And I want you to hear this. We get out of the Christian life what we put into it. We reap what we sow, and the more we invest into the kingdom of God, the higher will be our return. You know, there's an investment principle that says maximize your highest conviction. And so if we believe that Christianity is really true, then let's give it our all. Let's push all of our chips on Jesus, amen? Let's be all in, because with the measure we use, it will be measured to us. And the same is true of giving. You're like, I knew this was coming. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Second Corinthians, I just got to slip it in. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You know, I think that actually, I think Christians are supposed to tithe. And I think you're supposed to donate to the Lord, actually your local church, 10% of your gross income, right? I think that's just kind of a baseline. I've actually, and I'm not trying to big time anybody, I'm just trying to be transparent, is I've actually gone beyond that now. I think I'm doing about 15% of my gross income because I believe in this. I'm, I'm like putting God to the test. I'm like, okay, here we go, Lord. <laughs> and I mean, I can afford to do it. I'm not just like gambling with God. You know what I mean? Like I, I can like, yeah, I can, and there are people that teach that. They teach, you know, it's like seed faith. It's like it's God gambling. I'm not God gambling. I mean, I can, I, I can cut back on my Starbucks consumption. I can cut back in other areas. But now I'm giving about 15%, 15, 15 to 20% because I'm taking God at his word. And I'm expecting God to be faithful to his word. All right, Lord, I'm sowing bountifully, and I expect you to bless me bountifully. But each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Thirdly, the kingdom growth comes from God. Verses 26 through 29, the kingdom of God is if, as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now look, yes, yes, we work hard. Yes, we preach the gospel everywhere, and we scatter seed on the ground Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, that we work together with God. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 6, that we're to be hardworking farmers. We're to plow the ground. We're to fertilize it with our prayers. We're to prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. We're to make straight paths for God so that Christ can come. We're to do all that we can to create the most optimal environment for the seed of the gospel to grow in. But listen to this. Only God can make the seed grow. All kingdom growth comes from God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 7, he says, I planted Apollos water, but what does it say? But God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters anything, but only God who gives the growth. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the, to the Lord. And I want you to hear something, and this is especially true in the church world. Not all growth is objectively good. We can look at a particular ministry or a particular church and go, well, wow, they're growing really fast. Yeah, there's another thing that grows really fast, and it, it starts with the C. It's called cancer. <laughs> not, not, all, not all growth is good. There's some growth that's harmful. And there's actually a lot of toxic things that grow fast. There's a little thing in my shower that I have to keep constant tabs on. <laughs> and boy, does it grow fast. Can I get an amen out there, anybody? And I don't have a cleaning lady. I'm the cleaning lady, okay? So, cleaning person, I apologize. Cleaning, cleaning person. <laughs> it's called mold. And if I can, you know, when you get black mold in your apartment, it can make you really sick. 
And you know what? That grows crazy fast. It grows big. It's got a lot of Instagram followers. You know what I mean? But it is toxic, and it is not good for you. All growth is not objectively good. What we want is kingdom growth, God-given growth, and that only comes from the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who built it. And Zechariah 4, 6, if you know it, say it along with me. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Look, I want our church to grow, but I want movement to be a work of the Holy Spirit. God told me that a couple of months back. It was maybe it was like seven or eight months ago. I was over here. I was on my knees crying and worshiping like I always do, right? And I was just thinking, I was just, and I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, Mike, he said, he, said, he says, pray them in. Pray them in. And just pray that, pray that I will bring people and I will work in their hearts. Now, the other thing about the seed, which is the word of God, is that actually the power is within the seed itself. We don't have to make the word of God powerful. We don't need to add any sauce to it, as Kanye says. Amen? <laughs> the word of God is, that's what Kanye said. He's like, he's like, he's, he, he was going to like this little Baptist church in Calabasas. He just like this old school Baptist church. He's like, look, I don't need any sauce. I just want the straight word of God. <laughs> We don't need to add any sauce to it. We don't need to try to like make the word of God more powerful. It's inherently powerful within itself. And that's actually good news that all you have to do is literally just share the gospel and within the words of the gospel in some strange way that I understand is supernatural power. That message is supernatural power. That, that, that series of words strung together in a sentence, that, those words have a supernatural power behind them. You say, well, where does it say that? All right, I got three verses for you. Romans 1, 16. Paul says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is what is the power of God. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and powerful. And how this all happens, how the kingdom keeps growing, honestly, to me, is a big, beautiful, divine mystery. We don't know how it all happens. And we don't know all the things that God is doing behind the scenes. As I, as I share that illustration about being at the ferry terminal and some random church I've never heard of is like running Bible verses and another group I've never heard of is singing hymns. That's God orchestrating all that. God is the master sovereign one who's putting it on the heart of this church to run Bible verses, putting it on the heart of this church to sing hymns. I have no connection to them. I don't even know who they are, but God is orchestrating this whole big thing and how he does it all is one big beautiful mystery. We just do our part. We scatter the seed everywhere that we can and we trust God for the growth. And you know what? And this is good news because we can rest in that. The kingdom of God does not rise or fall on us. And I've used this terminology before and it's not biblical and, you know, so I repent publicly right now is <laughs> we don't build the kingdom of God. We don't build it. The Lord builds his kingdom through us. We just get the privilege of being the instrument through which he does it. And you know what? And if we don't make ourselves available, he'll just pass over us and he'll just use somebody else. Everybody is replaceable in the kingdom of God. He doesn't need us, but he'll use us. And I want to be the person that he uses. And when you're used by God to build his kingdom, I can honestly say it's like the most addictive thing in the world. You think video games are addictive? Imagine being used by the Lord and the Spirit of God working through you to build his kingdom. It's, it's the most amazing thing in the world. That's my biggest fear. Honestly, one of the things that's kept me from like totally blowing my life up is the fear of not being able to be used by the Lord ever again. That's so terrifying to me because it's the great privilege of my life to be an instrument through which God can build his kingdom. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Back when I was a youth pastor, I was doing these youth outreaches in Ireland, and I had built these, like, skateboard ramps, and, and, and I was just, like, this super ambitious, like, anxious, hard to imagine, right, 26-year-old youth pastor, right? And I'm thinking, we got to reach the world for Jesus, and we got to build God's kingdom, and all these Irish people need to, need to hear the gospel, and what are we going to do? How are we going to reach the world? And I'm, I'm like having like a little nervous breakdown, right, at this, at this Irish McDonald's, right, which the McDonald's in Ireland are pretty awesome, right? 
They serve Irish beef, so the hamburgers actually taste like hamburger. Can I get an amen on that? So, so I'm at this Irish McDonald's, like overwhelmed with how are we going to reach the world and what are we going to do? And I got to build God's kingdom. And I felt like the whole thing was like hinging on me, right? And I look out the window, and it's this beautiful Irish, you know, countryside. And there's this tall grass, and the wind is blowing through this tall grass. And the Holy Spirit reminds me of John chapter 3, verse 8, where Jesus told Nicodemus, and I'm literally, like, I'm watching the wind blow through this grass, and the Holy Spirit reminds me of this verse, the wind blows where it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit told me, he says, you know what, Mike? I've been building my kingdom for 2,000 years, <laughs> and I'm going to continue to build my kingdom. I'm moving all over the world in ways you could never imagine, you could never understand. Just relax. <laughs> it doesn't rise or fall on you. You just do your part. You do the best that you can. You serve me in whatever little sphere I give you, and don't worry about the bigger plan because I'm taking care of everything. Amen? We can rest in that, and we can feel that pressure lift off of us. And we can't save anybody. Jesus says, no one can come to the Father unless I draw them, okay? So we share the gospel, we do everything we can, but the kingdom of God doesn't rise or fall on what we do or don't do. We just get the privilege of being the instruments through which God works. And the last principle, and uh, Stuart, you can come up wherever you are out there. Um, the kingdom will begin small, but will one day fill the universe. And Christian, I want you to hear this, you know, you constantly have to keep in your mind as a follower of Jesus the big picture, that one day the kingdom of God is going to cover the earth and it's going to fill the entire universe, that Jesus is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So when you have apocalyptic Wednesday, when the sky turns orange because winds are blowing down from Canada and you think, this is it, this is the end of the world, your heart doesn't collapse because you realize that beyond the coming darkness or whatever, Jesus is coming, amen? The kingdom of God is coming. That's where our hope is. This world, I hate to break it to you, it's a sinking ship. It's a house that's on fire. Our hope isn't in this world. Our hope isn't in the stock market. It's not in the economy. It's not in the United States. Our hope is in the kingdom of God. And one day it will fill the universe. But Jesus says this. He says, what can we compare the kingdom of God or what, sh or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And when it's sown... It grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. So in this parable, Jesus talks about mustard seeds. Now, mustard seeds are these tiny seeds. They're around one to two millimeters in diameter. And in Jesus' world, they were the smallest of all seeds. I should have had a follow-up slide. I apologize. I just got the seed slide. It's a... But what's crazy is that tiny little seed, it was the smallest seed in Jesus' world. When you planted it, it could grow up into a tree that was 25 feet high. And it would be bigger than every other garden plant in the garden. Mustard seeds, and also because they, beca they can grow to 25 feet high, they can actually become a nesting habitat for birds. That little seed can create a nesting habitat for birds. Mustard seeds are these little miracles of nature. You would never expect that something so small could produce something so great. And Jesus says the kingdom of God is the same way. The mustard seed in this parable is who? It's Jesus. Good job, Leo. <laughs> he, had, he had coffee this morning, so he's with me, amen? The kingdom of God did not begin with a powerful military. It didn't begin with tons of money and resources. To be honest, I know this sounds hardcore, but Jesus was broke. Do you realize that? He had no money. He says, birds of the, you know, birds of the air have nests, foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He didn't even have an apartment. He wasn't even in public housing. He had nowhere to live. He had no money. The kingdom of God began with the tiniest of all seeds. It began as a single man in Israel 2,000 years ago, dying and rising from the dead. It began with one man, Jesus. But since his death and resurrection, his kingdom has spread across the planet to every continent and has become the largest religion in the world. As I've shared before, over two billion people identify themselves in some way with Jesus Christ. 
And they estimate that between 30 to 40,000 people a day are coming to Jesus Christ. And one day when Jesus returns, his kingdom will cover the earth and it will fill the entire universe. But where did it all begin? Right here along the shores of the Sea of Galilee in this simple carpenter from Nazareth named Jesus. And we can't despise small beginnings. Every great thing for God begins small. David Fitch, he wrote this great book about the 24-7 prayer movement called Enthroned. I just got it from Amazon the other day. Thank you for Amazon, Lord Jesus. And, uh, and he has this quote. Look at this quote. It's a little bit long, and I'm going to begin to conclude with this. Don't despise your small prayer gatherings. Actually, our prayer gatherings are, are getting pretty big. They're growing, right? Every major revival has its origins with a small band of intercessors faithfully crying out. Small gatherings precede what? big breakthroughs. When we gather to worship and pray, regardless of size, we convene the very court of heaven on earth. Our prayer gatherings are the most important and powerful gatherings in our city. The church began with 120 people waiting upon God in prayer for 10 days in an upper room in Jerusalem. And today, that little church is over 2 billion strong with 40,000 people a day coming to know Jesus Christ. No one could have ever imagined that something so small could become so great, and that's exactly what Jesus prophesies about in this passage. Isn't that fascinating? Come on, let's give Jesus a round of applause. Isn't that amazing? Exactly what Jesus said would happen, my man, happens. And then the last thing he says in verses 33 through 34, he says, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. And this is the last thing I want to share. This this shows us why it's so important to spend time with Jesus. Because you know what happens is when we spend time with Jesus, you know what he does? He explains to us everything. Everything. But you got to get alone with him, and you got to spend time with him, and you got to listen to him. And if you will do that, he will explain everything to you. I don't know if I have a slide for this, but Psalm 25, 14 is one of my favorite verses. I don't know if I have a slide for this. It says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear, with them that fear him. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear them. As we get alone with Jesus, he explains everything to us by the Holy Spirit. So we see four kingdom principles in these parables. Kingdom light is meant to be shared in the kingdom with the measure we use. It'll be measured to us kingdom growth comes from God and the kingdom will begin small but will one day fill the entire universe. Isn't that good news? Isn't that the best news the world's ever heard? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Everybody stand up. And what I want us to do in these final moments, we're going to sing two last worship songs. I I taught a little longer than I normally do is In this room this morning, here's what I want us to do. I want all of us to ask in these final moments that God would fill us with boldness and confidence and courage and that he would help us to go public with our faith, that he would help us take the gospel and the message of Jesus beyond the four walls of the church, beyond just our private lives, but into our public lives. And I pray for the whole church in New York City, that the church of New York City would get out from behind the four walls and it would begin taking the gospel in a loving, kind, sweet, beautiful way into the real life of New York City. And I know, that, I know that's terrifying, and I know that fills us with fear, but all we have to do is ask God for boldness, and he'll give us boldness. Every weakness we have, all you have to do is just go to God with your weakness and just be honest with him, and he'll help you. God isn't expecting us to do this in our own ability. We just have to come to him and say, God, I'm weak in this area. Help me, and he will help us. He loves to help us. So that's what I want us to do in these final moments. This is, we sing these last two worship songs privately in your own heart. I want you to pray to God and say, God, fill me with boldness. Fill me with confidence. Fill me with courage. And like everybody else in our culture, help me to be vocal and public about what I believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Let's lift our hands and ask God to fill us all with boldness in these final moments.
there's no darkness in your eyes. There's no question in your mind, God Almighty. God of mercy. There's no hiding from your face. There's no striving in your grace. God of
God, you're amazing. And Lord, you never fail. We fail, but you never do, God. And Jesus, you said you would build your kingdom, you would build your church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Nothing can stop you, Jesus. Lord, let your light shine in New York City. Bring revival to this city. And we pray that Jesus would become the highest name in this city, God. We pray that all 8 million New Yorkers would hear and see and know that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that you are the answer and you are the cure. Give us boldness, give us confidence, give us courage, and help us be your light in this dark world. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a big round of applause. All right, you're dismissed. Have a wonderful Sunday. Stay hydrated. Wear sunscreen. Sunscreen is fun screen, okay? God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.